This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Tick Ticks. Buying tickets shouldn't be anonymous. We are built for fans, by fans. Available on Android and iOS. Are you ready? Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. <laughs> There you go. You can't stop the Flames when they're red hot. And right now we've got a red hot team and a 10-game win streak. Matt, how it feel to be part of a franchise tying record? Well, that is one of those things that uh, when I was a kid, I remember looking at the record books and going, like, how did those teams in the 80s and early 90s not put together a 10-game winning streak in any of that time? And it's taken a little while for them to actually manage to do so, but that was an amazing shootout by Brian Elliott to secure the 10th straight win over Pittsburgh. For those that don't know the song we played at the intro, that's a song that was recorded by the 86 Stanley Cup Finals team. Um, it was dubbed over. You can find the video in the show notes for this week if you go to firesidechat.ca and click on this week's episode. And it, I believe that was actually Brett Hall that was supposed to be singing that. So it's called Red Hot, and it's about how you can't touch the Flames when they're red hot. And Matt, I think as Flames fans, this is one we're always going to remember. When you think back to those iconic moments as a Flames fan, you know, you're going to have the 4 run. You're going to have a few different memories. But I think for me, this 10-game win streak is going to be one of them. Yeah, and it's one of those weird stretches of games where it's not like the team is playing – teams that are terrible most of the teams that they've faced are teams that have been on a roll uh and they just end their winning streaks and do it in convincing fashion for sure and you know i mean it'd be one thing if we went on a win streak and it really meant nothing but looking at the streak we're putting together it's the right streak at the right time and i think this is really going to be what vaults the calgary flames into the postseason I, for me, I think the Flames have already kind of got that cinched up with a 10-point lead over the ninth stand place team, the LA Kings, in the standings with only 14 games left for them, 13 for us. Like, that, there's just not enough time for that to happen. I think outside of even the standings, though, I think this tells this team and the players who are wearing a Flaming C this year, we're legit. This is for real. You know, yeah. we, we can do this. We can beat these teams, these great teams that are out there. And, you know, we can do it convincingly. And I think you're right. The standings, the story was already being told. But I think that this is convincing fans and players that, you know what, we can do this. Like, you know, Yeah, we, well, this is the, the kind of progression that I was kind of expecting from the team. Like, from two years ago, last year I was expecting them to build on it. And then this year have a season sort of like this where they're in the top two spots in the Pacific and looking like a actual threat in the playoffs and now their team seems to have put enough pieces together where they could actually vie for the division possibly and could end up doing some damage in the postseason once they get there. You know, and you're right about that, but the thing that does worry me, and, I, you know, we tend to be short-sighted as Flames fans and as sports fans in general, but this season is a sum of its parts, and the hockey season's a long season. And if you look back, the Flames had two horrible stretches, one in October and one in January. They didn't start out the season well. They had a six-game winning streak in late November and early December. Then they didn't look great again, and now they have their current streak, which just happens to come at a really crucial time. But all of those games have the same weight in the standings. When it comes down to it, every game means the same. So I guess it makes you wonder if they're going up and down this year. What's to say that we don't hit the end of the season, go on a cold streak, and we're out? Well, you also have to remember that at the beginning of the season, both Monaghan and Gaudreau had not played at all during the preseason. And... TJ Brody was learning how to play a new position because he's always been a right defenseman in the NHL and learning to be a left defenseman. We had two new goaltenders. 
two new goaltenders, a whole new system. So the first like 15, 16 games that they struggled through to the middle of December or November, you can kind of write that portion of the schedule off just due to the fact that not only were they playing mostly elite teams, they just didn't have their stuff together at that point. And, like, ever since then, the Flames have been pretty much one of the top set six or seven teams in the NHL standings overall. And over that, like, 55-game stretch, that uh, gives you a good indication of what this team is. And I don't see this team magically falling on their face between now and the end of the season unless they run into severe injury troubles. Yeah, I think if you look at the standings, too, and we talked about this at the beginning of the season, I really think that a weak Pacific division overall has really helped the Flames, too. Oh, for sure. Like, all the teams are kind of... Like, even Anaheim is not the same Anaheim Ducks team that we've come to know. Like, they're a step below where they normally are, and Vancouver's even more bad than they usually are. So, Matt, if we look at the standings as they sit today on March 14th when we record... If we were talking back before the first game when we got, you know, beaten mightily by the Oilers, and I were to tell you that the Oilers were sitting in the first wild card spot with 79 points, Anaheim was just above them, tied with us for 82, and San Jose held the lead with 89. What would you have thought? Is that the way you would have expected this division to shake down? Yeah, pretty much. The, it, there's nothing really surprising about the standings, and especially like with LA, I would have expected them to be a little higher than where they're at, but losing Jonathan Quick and having Anze Kopitar play as badly as he has this season, it's understandable why they're about 8-10 points below where they Back should be. Back at the be. beginning, I would have expected LA to be in the playoff run, and I... I was honestly thinking that Winnipeg might be doing better than they were. But, yeah, I would have expected L.A. in and St. Louis out. Yeah, probably. I I think Ed, I would have had Edmonton slightly on the outside, actually. Yeah, I, I knew they were going to be a bit better just because of the McDavid effect, but I didn't expect them to do as well as they have. No, they're about five or six points ahead of where they. I was kind of expecting them at this point. Yeah, I expected playoff hockey. I just didn't expect them to do as well as they have. Yep. And uh, if they actually fall behind St. Louis, which is looking likely just due to how pathetic St. Louis's opponents are the rest of the way, uh, they'll their first round matchup will be against either Minnesota or Chicago, and have fun with that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, Edmonton won't make it out of that first round. Four games and golfing. Well, why don't we recap the week that has been for Flames fans? It was quite a week for uh, the Calgary Flames. They started the week at home on the 9th of uh, of March, and this started what is kind of their hellish schedule where they've, they're have they playing every other day from here till the rest of the season. And they were taking on the Montreal Canadiens, one of the more powerful teams in the NHL this year. And the Flames, let's... Let's be fair, Carey Price was not in net, but the Flames were still able to easily dominate Montreal. Goudreau notched four points, and Elliot recorded a 24-save shutout as the Flames beat the Canadiens 5-0 for Elliot's first-ever shutout as a Flame. Well, I I thought, and this is going to sound weird, I actually thought Goudreau had a bad game. <laughs> and I saw the stat sheet at the end of the night, and it's like, uh, how did he get four points? <laughs> Uh, I just, it seemed like every time he was playing with the puck, it, he'd be turning it over and just not, things didn't seem to be clicking for him, but four points I is four that, points. I think that also tells you something about maybe the way that Montreal was playing. True. You know, if Goudreau's not having a great night, and I mean, they're making him turn it over, I thought that they were playing pretty good in their own zone, Montreal, in this one. Um... I don't think that necessarily the score is reflective of their entire team's play. I don't think they played their best game. But I think this all largely came down to the fact that they did not have Carey Price in net. They had Al Montoya. And I'll, I thought on the Stone goal, the Monaghan goal, and the Furlan goal for sure, it was really just beating the goaltender. Yeah, well, when you outshoot the opposition 38-24 and you're basically dominating the entire game, it 
it's yeah i think even if carry price was in it probably would have been a two or three nothing final so montreal just didn't seem to have any offensive cohesion at all in the game no and one thing i give the credit credit to the flames for is they didn't do what we've seen in the past where their opponent sense comes out not playing and the flames sort of drop their compete level to match their opponent I thought the Flames kept their compete level on all night. They had really good position in the offensive zone, and I thought the de- the defensemen and the defensive zone play, we were really able to take Montreal out of the shooting lanes, and I think that's a big reason why they didn't get as many shots as they'd like to. Yeah, and like especially I was concerned after the first period, the Flames outshot the Canadians 16-5, to and I was expecting, because they only managed the one goal, that, like, are they going to fall back and, like, Montreal will have a bounce-back period and then, you know, might lose the game, but they just kept the foot on the gas pedal and just rolled right over them. They definitely kept their feet on the gas. And, and I mean, that's if you want to be an elite team, that's what you have to do. Yeah, and that's one of the things that seems to have changed about this team is that they are having that killer instinct. And even a good team like Montreal, like ever since they've uh, hired Claude Julien, they were 7-2 and two heading into that game. And the Flames handled them like it was like we were playing Arizona or something like that like yeah who cares you're no big deal one of the interesting stats from this game if you take a look at the time on ice um we had Backlund getting over 17 minutes on ice Froelich getting exactly 17 minutes those guys had a lot of ice time Monahan had 16 but then right behind him is Troy Brower Brower got even more time than Bennett Furlan that sort of thing so I guess when you're up by that much you can experiment and rest your top guys and when you said earlier that Goudreau didn't look as good, to me, I think maybe, and I'm just looking at the, uh, I don't have the number of shifts here. He played a lot of time, but I've kind of felt that Goudreau maybe didn't look as good because he didn't have to do as much. Like, I think maybe Goudreau is looking at this as, you know what, we're up. I don't need to be Johnny Hockey. Yeah, that's possible. You know, I mean, he did score a goal, but he just, he didn't need to be the magician that maybe did in the Pittsburgh game. True. So we will uh, we'll move on to the next game, unless there's anything else you want to talk about on this one. Goals came from Giordano, Stone, Monaghan, Furland, and Goudreau. And interesting note, that's Michael Stone's second goal of the year. So, I mean, I guess that's why you get moved is you're slumping, but glad to have him here. Yeah, well, the one unfortunate thing about that game was uh, losing both Hamilton and Stone in that game. But we'll talk about that more later. And actually, to their credit there, well, you're mentioning that, I actually thought that, um, you know, the Flames with four defensemen still managed to play very well. Oh, for sure. And Derek England has really elevated his game of late. Even uh, well, but... with being partnered with Bartkowski, he, he's looked more like playoff England instead of just everyday England. But, I mean, even in the past when we've had, say, you know, uh, Giordano injured and England had to step up. He does very well in that sort of, you know, increased role for a limited amount of time. I agree, and that's something like once Stone gets back in the lineup full time, uh, I'm looking forward to having three defense pairings that are all very good at shutting down the opposition. Which means you want Weidman out there, right? Uh, no. <laughs> We'll um, get to that after, know, too. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be the first guy to admit, I've never been a fan of the England sign. I always thought he was overpaid for what he was when we got him. I've never thought he was a great defenseman. I thought he was a serviceable 5-6. But this year, he's come around. And, I, you know, I think he's done well for us in the role we needed. But I don't know that I would re-sign him. I think that I, I personally think he's going to go to Vegas. He's a Vegas boy. He'll be there for sure. But even if he wasn't, I think you can find somebody there internally well, or a Mike, free agent who's cheaper. Yeah, well, I think uh, getting Stone is actually kind of his replacement because they're both a larger physical defenseman and able to clear the front of the net. It just Stone has a little bit more offensive upside. So You could be right. Yeah, uh, and you also have to remember that England's 34 now, I think. So like, yeah. you don't want to be giving a three-year deal or something like that to him, where a team like Las I Vegas th- could definitely do that because, hey, veteran guy, yay. 
Well, veteran guy, hometown guy, looks good on the marquee, and you give him a three-year deal, and he'll play out his career there. Maybe he becomes the first jersey retired. I don't know about that, but... <laughs> or, sorry, honored like we have. Forever a Golden Knight. After three years. Yeah, that's such a lame name for a hockey team, but we'll talk about that <laughs> down the road. <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll wait until we see their roster. Maybe it'll be intimidating despite the name. The Ducks is a terrible name, too. The Ducks doesn't strike fear into your heart, does it? The Ponda Center does, but, you know. There you go. Um, well, let's talk about the quick road trip the Flames made. They went just east to visit Winnipeg and played in the MTS Center against the Winnipeg Jets. In this one, the Triple M line came up big with Froelich and Backlund both scoring. And Brian Elliott made a 31-save attempt to get his second shutout as a Flame and his second consecutive shutout for the Flames' ninth consecutive win. Thoughts on this one, Matt? Oh, I'm glad that the Flames were playing Winnipeg in this game. If they were playing a halfway decent team, I think that would have been the end of the winning streak. Uh, how the Jets turned it on in the beginning of the first and second period, like if it wasn't for Brian Elliott, the team could have got down early and often, <laughs> frankly. I thought the first half of the first and the first half of the second were all Jets. Yeah, and he held the fort, and then once the Flames had some pushback, they scored it in each period, and then it was – the Jets pretty much just gave up at that point. You know, and, and I, I've heard some people debate this, and I'm curious on your thoughts. Some people said that Brian Elliott stole this one for the Flames. I personally don't think Elliot stole it, but I think Elliot's giving us the kind of goaltending you need, which is, you know what, he's keeping us in there even when everyone else is bad, and he's keeping it close to let the Fords do their job and go get the goals. You know, I didn't think that Elliot stole this one necessarily, but he was solid enough to keep the puck out, and it's like, okay, guys, get it going quickly. I can only do this so long. Yeah, and you just need reliable goaltending, and that's something that we frankly haven't had since Kipper back probably in 2008 and it's one of those situations that it's a nice luxury to have and it's almost foreign for Flames fans in recent years to have a goalie that you can actually rely on to make the saves when it actually matters yeah and I mean this is the Brian Elliott that we gave up a second round pick for and I'm hoping that once the season's done that he and Johnson will be back because they've been a really serviceable pairing for the team. They have. Before this game, in response to the injuries on the blue line that Matt mentioned earlier, the Flames called up Rasmus Anderson from Stockton. He did not play. He was scratched along with Freddie Hamilton, Curtis Lazar, and Michael Stone, which means that for those that didn't watch the game, Dennis Weidman did draw into the game. Uh, we'll talk more about his performance later, but Weidman played 14 minutes and 44 seconds, the second least minutes of any defenseman. The only guy behind him was Mar Matt Bartkowski. So we'll talk more about that in the future, but... Why don't we look ahead to the next game of the week? This was the one I was worried about. How about you, Matt? I didn't. Well, even in our predictions last week, I didn't have this one as a win. And, you know, we beat Pittsburgh both times last season, and we beat them earlier this year. They're the best team and what whom I consider to be the likely favorite to win the Stanley Cup this year. So... You know, you beat the guys three times. I didn't see a fourth one. And it was probably the best game I have seen since about 92-93 from the Calgary Flames. Even though I took Pittsburgh in, the stand in our prediction game last week, I was being a bit of a homer. Yeah. I honestly, in my heart, did not think the Flames would make, make it through the Pittsburgh Penguins, but you want the win streak to keep going. Yeah, for sure. Um, but, yeah, I agree with you. This might be the best Flames game that I've seen all year, if not in years. Yeah, I have to go back to, like, when the Flames still had guys like Flurry, Neuendijk, McKennis, Vernon. <laughs> like Pre-Young Guns, wow. Yeah, like, it, it's been a very long time since I've seen a complete domination. Or, you know, like, it looked like the two favorites for the Stanley Cup who are both on their game having a good game against each other. 
Like each team was on their game, playing great. All forty guys on the ice, or thirty eight, were on their game. Both goalies were great, and it was just an awesome game. Yeah, I thought that at least from the Flames, if I look at it, I didn't see anyone who made a glaring mistake. You know, usually you watch and you go, oh, this guy made this mistake or that mistake. Everybody was on, I think, every shift doing what they had to do. Yeah, and like even Alex Chason had perhaps his best game as a Flame. and Dennis Weidman got a goal. Yeah, like everybody contributed. It, it, there was no passengers. Lance Boma was hitting everybody left, right, and center, it seemed. And it just everybody seemed really engaged on the ice, and it they were rewarded with two points. I wonder if we would have had the same results from this team had the win streak not been in place. I have a feeling this was probably a big pride game for all these guys. Yeah, I think so too. And yeah, I'm expecting a similar effort <laughs> against Boston tomorrow. Uh, you know, it's something that literally the Calgary Flames have never done before. And going up against the Stanley Cup champions, you you know, it's not going to be an easy game. And, like, yeah, Pittsburgh's a bit beat up, but still, they're, all their best players are there, except for Latang. So, Well, and to me, this was the real test of, okay, so the Flames, who are still in their rebuild, go against a team that is elite level. And we stand our ground. Whether we won or lost in the shootout, I think we still stood our ground. I would have been happy if this win streak ended in the shootout. Like, we've gone as far as we can go, and that's fine. It's a noble way to lose. But I think that we stood our ground against one of the elite teams in the NHL, and that, to me, is promising with postseason hockey, you know, right around the corner. And not only did we stand toe-to-toe with one of the good teams, they were on a six-game winning streak themselves. Like, they weren't just having a bad stretch like we were in January. They were on their game, and... Yet the Flames still found a way to win. For sure. Taking a look at the Flames' goals in this one, Derek England opened the scoring um, for his fourth of the season. And then when the Penguins were up 2-1, to we had a second-period goal from Dennis Weidman, his fourth of the year. And in the third period, the game, uh, Johnny Goudreau brought the Flames ahead to a 3-2 score, and then Sidney Crosby ended up tying it up late in the third. We went to the overtime, nothing got settled, and of all people, Chris Versteeg ended up winning this one in the shootout for the Flames. Versteeg, I think, has been phenomenal, and I, I've said this, I said this last week too, every game that Versteeg has played lately, I've been looking at him and saying, this guy you know, is looking great, and this is why the Flames brought him in, right? They needed that veteran presence, and he's showing us exactly what we needed, and at 950000 this guy's a steal. Yep. I can't argue with you there. Um, just hope that he keeps it up once the postseason starts and that like he doesn't get too banged up dirt when the games start getting a little more physical. And Well, and you remember at the beginning of the season what happened with him. You know, he was very fragile. Yeah, so like uh, I'm still concerned about that, but he's been great recently. And even when he's having a so-so game, he's still decent the other interesting thing in this game is very very few penalties for each team um calgary took eight minutes the penguins took six but all of the key gate most of the key goals seem to be i mean the malkin one was a power play goal and the gujo one was a power play goal <laughs> but i'd say the two most important goals of the game both power play goals so this was one of those times when on both sides, your opponent was going to make you pay for being in the box. Yeah, and that Gaudreau goal may have been the goal of the year for the Flames, and just an awesome individual effort. I really thought in this one, I was worried at the beginning of the game. I thought the, the Penguins came out and they had better foot speed. They were moving a lot quicker, and I thought they'd be able to outwork, not outwork, but outskate the Flames in that way be too quick where the flames couldn't catch them but we did a good job of playing our game we did a good job of keeping them angled out to the boards we did a good job of you know takeaways in the neutral zone the flames found a way and they've obviously been watching the footage the tape but they did a good job of countering the quickness of the penguins i think with the physical let's call it western canadian daryl sutter style play that they're known for yeah and that's part of the reason why i think that 
the Penguins are going to be the team to beat in the postseason once again because that speed is just murder on anybody. And it's difficult to go up against a team like that. And credit to Calgary for doing their own thing and managing to win. Uh, that, honestly, like if the, say like the Flames somehow get to the Stanley Cup Finals and they meet up against the Penguins, I don't see them beating them. Uh, no. Like they might win a game or two, but I don't see the Flames managing to beat them there's a number of eastern conference teams that i do think the flames could beat but them no <laughs> but if you look at i mean look at the last time we we're in the stanley cup finals the toll it took on our team i mean we were playing with how many guys from the ahl i think this year be no different in order to get to the the stanley cup finals this year it's going to be costly on your roster and i'm not convinced we would have the depth it would take that by the time we get there you know with let's say a shillington or an anderson or a lazar or you know, Poirier in the lineup, that we can beat this team. No. We barely beat them with our full lineup. Yeah, and they're half, they had seven people out of their lineup, so. Exactly. Yeah. Like, it, it'd be fun, but, <laughs> yeah. It, I don't see it. Honestly, I don't see anybody beating Pittsburgh to win the cup this year. I think this game, and, you know, I've talked about them, you know, I was high on them earlier as a potential Flames acquisition, but this game really showed... Mark andre Fleury as, you know, he's sort of been the backup in Pittsburgh all year, but I think really in the second period, he kept the pens in it. I thought the Flames had a lot of great chances in the second, a lot of good shots that you can tell Fleury's one of the best in the game still, even at his age. Well, I wouldn't go that far, but he's still a, a starting goaltender, and every once in a while he can throw up a good game, and... Last night, but I think it's night. I yeah. think he's got that mental part of a veteran. You know, I think a younger guy like a Matt Murray might have been phased by some of that, but you can tell that he's that grizzled vet. Yeah, and like even in recent games, he hasn't been performing too badly. Like it, checking the game logs, like there's only a couple of performances in the last couple months that have been subpar. So, yeah, it. Could it be easily be one of those same situations that the Flames had with Elliot, where just a slow start and getting better? Because I'm looking at like his early season starts, and there's a lot of bad, <laughs> bad numbers there at the beginning. So he seems to be getting a lot better as the season's going on. He's also got more minutes as the seasons have gone on. Yeah. Um, the last thing I'll say about the Pittsburgh game is I was kind of worried in the uh, overtime. The Flames had, you know, some decent chances, so did Pittsburgh, but I thought Pittsburgh did a really good job of keeping the Flames out of scoring position. Yeah. Over Mind you, they also had a one-man advantage for most of the overtime. But Yeah, and that was not a comfortable two minutes. As a, I, I uh, was biting my nails the entire two minutes. Yeah, so was I. It was not. I thought of all teams, uh, guys, of all teams, you want to give a man advantage. This is not the one. Yeah, when you got Crosby and Malkin and Kessel and Schultz, yeah, that, that's not fun. <laughs> that's not fun no. at all. <laughs> you know, and we have we haven't seen a lot of shootouts this year, so it's nice to see the Flames in a shootout. I mean, I don't like them, but. You know, it's kind of nice to see what we got. Yeah, and we beat the Penguins both times in the shootout with Versteeg getting the only goal each time. For sure. So, Matt, why don't we move on from the games this week to talk about the injuries this week. And what a time to get injuries when we're on a 10-game winning streak. But in the Montreal game, Hamilton and Stone both went down with injuries. Hamilton is back. Stone is still out of the lineup. And as such, uh, the Flames called up Rasmus Anderson as a emergency recall. But... Dennis Weidman drew back in the lineup, and he's playing. And I want to get your thoughts on, you know, you've got this young kid coming up who you're bringing up for an emergency recall. I never thought we'd see Weidman in a Flames jersey again. Why do you put him in there? Well, it's a simple reason. You're allowed four normal recalls after the trade deadline. And you're allowed emergency recalls that do not count towards that four recall limit if you're not able to dress six players on the blue line or 12 forwards and with the flames having Weidman available in order to play Anderson they would have had to eat one of those four re regular recalls and they did not want to do that 
No, correct me if I'm wrong. It's four players, not four individual recalls. You can recall yeah. those four guys as many times as you want to. I do believe so, yes. So you could send a guy up and down and up and down and up and down if you really want to rack up his air miles. But it's four players. You don't have to declare who they are right away, I don't think. Um, but you can only use four of them. Yeah, it's just whenever the usage is needed. But it, you in in this situation, it was a emergency recall in case both Hamilton and Stone could not go in the Jets game. And Hamilton, despite having a cut on his leg, was able to go even though he didn't really play too much in that game, he still managed to get three assists, so that was all right. And, you know, I think the Weidman, I thought when I first saw it, I was surprised he went in, but then I thought, you know, here's a guy who has everything to play for. Here's a guy who's got everything to prove and might play better. I mean, he essentially lost his spot in the lineup to Matt Bartkowski, an AHL player who got signed as a free agent. Like, you know, here's a guy who's got to be saying to coaches, look, I can still play this game at this level. And since he's come back, he's really been protected. If you look at his minutes, if you look at the lineups that he's been up against, you know, he hasn't had to do a whole lot. But, you know, I think Weidman is still a serviceable number seven. He's not a guy I want out there, but that's really the role he's playing right now is a number seven. Yeah, and if you can shelter him on the third pairing and manage not to have him going up against, like, Crosby... <laughs> then you're fine. It, like uh, on road games, I wouldn't expect to see him in the lineup. But well, I was just gonna say, I said, you know, I was about to say we've had mostly home games and will continue to for the next week. So then the coach gets first pairing, and that makes it easier. Yeah, but we'll see. Uh, I'm not expecting Stone to be out for too much longer. He might miss a couple more games, but. I'm hopeful that by the time the <laughs> Flames go on their road trip next Wednesday, that he'll be back in the lineup. Well, it's hard this time of year, too, because if we weren't in the playoff picture, you'd probably shut both those guys down for the year. Yeah. You'd probably take Hamilton, Stone out, say, you know what, take the time, rest, recover, we'll call up Anderson, we'll you know put Weidman in, who cares? And as much as, much as we want Stone to come back, we also want to make sure he's ready for the playoffs. We don't want to rush him back and he gets hurt again. So there's that fine balance right now of if we are going to the postseason, I think right now as it looks, we're going to be in the postseason. Um, you know, you you have to make that balance. Definitely. And there's no reason to have a guy battered and bruised in the lineup needlessly at this point. Like even Hamilton getting rushed back was not necessarily the best situation but i think if the flames weren't on a winning streak i think they probably would have let hamilton sit for a game or two but and i wouldn't be surprised when this streak comes to an end if you see that if you maybe see those guys being reevaluated. yeah well plus i think hamilton was dictating it a little bit more than what the team wanted because he was apparently in pain towards the end of the jets game so because, you know, when you do have a skate cut on the side of your leg, it's going to hurt. <laughs> so, it, you know, it's one of those situations that it, you'll have to keep evaluating, but he seems to be doing all right, so it, we'll see. I think that's also a bit of a testament to, you know, Hamilton, that he is able to bounce back from that. I think it shows that he's a warrior, and he's one of those guys that you probably want to rely on in the in the playoffs um you know it's obviously not serious if they put him back in there but it's going to be hard to heal up playing hockey every other day and that's my worry is that you know at some point i think when they lose you might take hamilton out for a game or two just so he can actually get the rest he probably needs because <clears throat> we don't have a three four day stretch for him to sit a bit of importance for the flames is to by that last six-game stretch of the season where they're playing L.A., Anaheim, and San Jose twice each, they need to have a playoff spot pretty much locked up where like their magic number to get in is like one or two at that point. So that way like they can rest easy and not necessarily need to worry if they lose a couple of games and allow bodies to heal before the fun begins. So... Having the best players on the ice for like the next 
seven games that is important. It's just seeing how things shake out. Well, and that's an interesting thing you mentioned too, is there's some bodies here that, you know, with the Flames in their current form after this win streak, we really don't know where they fit in. And those are the two extra forwards being Curtis Lazar and Freddie Hamilton. And, you know, I mean, everybody's looked good during this win streak. I don't think there's one guy we can point out of saying, you know what, so-and-so looks terrible. We need to get them out of there. But after the win streak's over, I think that you might see some shuffling in the forward lines. Um, I think you need to get Curtis Lazar in the lineup. I think you need to see where he fits. And obviously, you're not going to do that when things are working. But, Matt, I don't know about you. I'm thinking that as soon as the uh, the win streak is over, I would sit Alex Chase on for a little bit on the fourth line, and I'd insert number 20, Curtis Lazar, into his spot with Stage and Boma. I'd probably wait a little longer until the Flames actually have the X by their name and that they're in the playoffs before putting Lazar in or recalling anybody else unless there's injuries. Like, obviously, if there's an injury, then Lazar probably draws in first, then Hamilton. I don't know. I'm kind of thinking that you can't do much damage on the third line. I mean, you're playing with Stage and Boma. You're pr- playing probably less than 10 minutes a night. It's not like he's, you know, the Dennis Weidman of forwards. I think that you have to see what you've got. Maybe you're right. Maybe you wait till you're clinched. But I just hate to, you know, clinch in the last game, and we really still don't know what we have in this guy going into the playoffs. Well, I'm sure that uh, once the Flames do clinch, then you're going to see probably all four of those recalls getting used and several guys getting a look like it, I wouldn't be surprised if Shillington and Anderson both get a game at the end of the season and probably Jankowski and Shin Carrick as well she then they break it down two forwards two defensemen. yeah and just rest a bunch of people so that way you can see especially in the playoffs you need to know like okay this guy is doing better than this guy so if say one of the defensemen gets hurt Anderson's doing a little better than Shillington, so you draw on him. Or if Stajan gets hurt, you put Jankowski in or whatever. And, and I think it also lets you, I mean, guys like Goudreau, guys like Monaghan, you know, it lets us sit those guys out and give them a bit of a rest before the, the postseason. Yeah, unless there's a, something to actually play for. Like when the last game of the season they were up against the Sharks, like if they're in a spot where they might be able to win the division, then I think you go with just the full lineup right through till the end. But the odds of that happening are kind of slim anyway. So Let's count our blessings with where we're at. Yeah, that'd be hilarious, though, if the Flames ended up winning the division. Like a, Hell, we might as well go for the Presence Trophy. Well, I don't think we'll get that good, but you know, it, it'd be interesting anyway if they could sneak the division. And like you were saying, at that point, I think you also see guys maybe get more ice time. I can see, you know, if we have Monaghan, Goudreau sitting out, um, you know, maybe you sit out Kachuk. I can see guys like Bennett, uh, Versteeg, and Brower's line getting a lot more ice time, also being elevated to that second line to really say, okay, what have we got here going into the playoffs? Because um, right now, the, the lines, we've got the 3M line of Kachuk, Backlund, Froelich. We've got Goudreau, Monaghan, Furland. We have Brower, Bennett, and Versteeg, and Boma, Stajan, and Chason. And, I mean, we know we've gotten Stajan. We know we've gotten Boma. Chason's been mediocre. I think he'd probably be one of those guys that I would have no problem trying Lazar there. And if he doesn't work, put Chason back. But um, I also think that Troy Brower, a lot of people don't like that signing, but I think we're going to like him come playoff time. Oh, yeah. And we're already starting to see that. He made quite a few smart plays against the Penguins, and – when he's engaged when the games matter that's the important thing and uh, you know the regular season he's a third second third line guy and he has been pretty much all season not great but just there but when the games matter that's when you want a guy like him in the lineup and if you look on that line, I mean, we've got the veteran in Brower on the right side. We've got the veteran in Versteeg on the left side. And right down the middle is the young player of Sam Bennett, number 93. And I don't know what you, Bennett's still having some struggles in my eyes this year. <clears throat> I think Bennett is a lot of where Michael Backlund has been for years and that we don't really know 
who he's going to develop into. I think that he's still redefining himself. I don't think he's going to be a pure scorer. I don't think he's going to be your big playmaker. I don't think he's ever going to be your number one, number two center. But I like that they've insulated him with two veterans. And if we take a look at his numbers this year, Bennett is on pace for just 27 points this year after his 36-point rookie season. He's currently 10th in scoring when I checked and likely to probably be caught by Michael Furland, especially now that Furland is playing with, you know, Monaghan and Goudreau full-time. Um, what do you, first off, do you think that there's any scenario where the Flames don't bring Bennett back next year? His contract is over. Oh, no, of course not. You bring him back without a doubt. It's just one of those situations where a lot of fans are impatient with Bennett. And you, you look at Monaghan, he stepped in, he basically became an all-star in his second season, not actually an all-star, but of that caliber. You look at Goudreau, he steps in, he's an all-star right from day one. And Bennett being the highest draft pick in franchise history, well, Calgary franchise history, there's the expectation of, oh, well, he had a good rookie season, and now he's going to step up and be a 60, 50, 60 point guy or better. And that's just not how things always work out. And you can see the skill is still there. And with him, I think he's probably missed seven or eight tap-in style goals or whatever. It, it's just, he's had some bad luck. And it's all largely overblown. Like, he's also learning how how to be a good responsible two-way player as well and it well that's what i was saying about backland earlier you know like backland sort of evolved into that really good two-way player and i think we're still figuring out what sam bennett's role will be on this team going forward i i see him as being a almost like a jordan stall type center where like defense is priority number one but can contribute offensively this is back when stall was with the penguins and i i think bennett has more offensive upside than what stall generated but like i i still see bennett as like a 60 70 point player when everything's working for him it's just he's 20 so like give the kid a break I like that they have him insulated by two veterans. Yeah, and it's the same deal with Kachuk. Like, he, he's playing with two very smart hockey players in Backlund and Kachuk, or for Leak, and that helps to gloss over some of the problems that Bennett or Kachuk has. And uh, similarly, Bennett's being allowed some leeway to learn from two guys who have won Stanley Cups and learn how to do that and like we've seen in the recent games like Bennett's getting more of a physical edge to him which is encouraging like we've seen him fight didn't he fight in what is the Winnipeg game? yeah and against both Ryan Johansson of Nashville and Jacob Truba from Winnipeg and he gave up like three four inches to each of them in like 30 pounds and yet he won each of the fights handily and when he's engaged both mentally and physically, he is a pain to play against. And he needs to learn how to incorporate that on a regular basis where he is getting under the other team's skin in much the same way that Kachuk has. And just harness that being a dirtbag type player and while using the offensive skill like it's hard to expect a guy like Bennett to create like 50 60 points when you're being stuck with Brower and Versteeg like that's no not really a slight on either of those guys it's just that but they're I also not I don't think we need him to be in that role no. yet no and but you you're not getting a, an actual scorer with him in either case and like back, uh, Bennett was with Pro Leak and Backland last year, and his offensive skill was a little bit more pronounced because he had legitimate top six forwards on his line. And the biggest thing to remember here, I think, is he's 20. And I think there's the thing that a lot of Flames fans forget. He's still evolving, he's still a young player, 
yes, maybe his hockey sense isn't where we want it to be, but he's got a lot of growing to do. And, you know, most players aren't fantastic at age 20. And I think this is a player that works hard. He tries. And, you know, I think the coaching staff can work with him. And I think Bennett will either be a uh, depth flame, sort of like Backlund for a long time, or he'll end up being a piece that will end up rendering the flames a good return in a trade. Honestly, I'm going to go with door number three, and I, I'm going to say him, Kachuk, Gaudreau, and Monaghan are going to be the four best players on the team and are going to be the four core forwards on the team. And, like, so, get rid of it. Like, if cap situation does not permit, you get rid of everybody else, but you keep those four guys. Just play one line and an extra forward. Yeah. Well, just like what Chicago did when they had to cycle out all sorts of good talented players over the years because they couldn't afford them they just kept the f the main guys that they had and find any farm guy who played cheap yeah like when they got Panarin or mm. you know sign college guys or what you know dig up any talent anywhere and throw them in the lineup and I think that for the Flames they need to keep a certain constituency of like whomever the best of the best are sort of like what Chicago did with Keith and Seabrook, Chalmerson, Taze, Kane, Hosa, like keep the main parts together. Everybody else is interchangeable. And I think for us, Gaudreau, Monaghan, Bennett, and Kachuk are those four guys up front. For now. Yeah. For now. So with that in mind then, Matt, Bennett's deals over the end of the year is a restricted free agent. What kind of deal can you see him getting from the Flames? Do you think we sign him to sign long term? Do you think we gets more of a bridge contract? Anywhere in the three three range, like three years, three million, plus or minus like two hundred and fifty thousand. Right now he's making uh, nine point two five million, but he got a two point three million dollar bonus last year, so his cap hit is three point one nine four million for this yeah, year. Yeah, nine hundred thousand, not nine million, but Oh, sorry. Yeah, nine hundred thousand. Oh point nine two five. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, nine million would be crazy. You're right. Um so he's I mean he's got a three million and change cap hit, which I think is fine. Yeah, and um, something around where his current cap hit is is fine. Like I, I you're kind of like if you were paying him based on results, it, probably two, two and a half. But for a three year deal, you give him a little, little bit more up front and a little less at the end of the three year contract. Yeah, and and I don't think you know the Flames are going to be looking at a six year, seven year deal here. I think three for three is very generous, but I think it shows a commitment to this player too. Yeah. And like and honestly, I, I, like his next contract, I expect to be like a six six deal. But it, it's just one of those you gotta earn. That. Yeah, exactly. And he hasn't rounded out his game enough to earn that yet. But you know, another three three deal, that's fine. And yeah, like I don't see him turning that down. And it seems like an agreeable so for each side. Uh, another player who, I mean, not this year. Um, yeah, another player who will be coming off the book soon next year will be Michael Backlund. Um, how do you think that, let's say, we do do a 3-3 deal with Bennett, how do you think that will affect the Backlund contract? As you know, that's over this year, too. No, it's next so year. You oh, you're right, 17-18. Yeah. Um, is Bennett in for another year, too, then? No, Bennett's at the end of this year, if I recall correctly. That's what I thought. Yeah. Uh, that's what I think. Okay. So, either way, how do you think that Bennett's deal will affect Backlund's deal? It, I don't, actually. I think they're mutually exclusive. You don't exclusive. think one will affect no. the other? I, honestly, I think Backlund is one of those players that you lock him up. He's basically, to me, is our Marion Hosa in terms of that quality middle six forward who's extremely intelligent and like Hosa's not as good as he was but one of the things that keeps him in the Chicago top six all the time is that he's just an extremely smart player and even though he's slower than he was and his skill level isn't quite there it's just his raw intelligence on the ice that keeps him there and you need smart players because it helps everybody else on the line. And Backlund has emerged as being 
one of the key pieces to this organization. And honestly, a five and a half, six million dollar a year contract for him, although it sounds high, it, the cap's also going to be like $73 million probably after next season, 74 or something like that. So it's not that big of a deal. And, you know, five or six years at like $6 million, that's perfectly fine and acceptable to me. So I just checked. You're right. Bennett is a restricted free agent at the end of this season, and Backlund is a unrestricted free agent end of next season. He's currently making three point five million. Yeah, and realistically, if you take Matt Stajan's contract at the end of next year, you toss that one out the window. You bring Jankowski up into that fourth line center spot, and you give the balance of Stajan's contract to Backlund. There you go. Like, well, I'm almost thinking you give Stajan's money to Bennett. Well. Bennett's contract will basically be what Bennett's cap hit is currently. So, yeah, which is pretty much Stajan's deal. Yeah. Um, so then Stajan comes off the books. You bring Janko up with current Bennett money, less than a million, and everything sort of you know stays in in its position. Yeah. So, uh, like uh, in terms of like overall talent, you wouldn't be losing anything once Stajan's contract expires because Jankowski and Stajan are going to be more or less interchangeable at that point. And, you know, you get to keep one of the key secondary features of the team, which is Backland, in your organization for another five or six years, hopefully. I think Ho I think Host is a good comparison to Backland. Um, just because he's that veteran, he's that veteran depth guy who I think will have a job for as long as he wants it. And there's always going to be an organization, hopefully it'll be us, who needs that position. He'll be sought after because he's a good two-way forward. Yeah, and trying to find smart players like Backlund who just have that instinctual game on the ice is, like, the most difficult thing to find. Like, you can get scorers like Goudreau, but getting those just really dynamite middle six guys that you can just throw out there with anybody and they'll make the other guys games better those are the guys that you hold on to through thick and thin like other guys you can just pitch out the window <laughs> you know it's like what chicago did when they had to get rid of brower and boland and bufflin and a whole bunch of other guys like it, yeah those aren't our key players so just get rid of them keep the important pieces and Backland is one of those as well. I also think that, you know, Backland's next contract will be his, probably his biggest contract. Like, he's 27 now. If he signs a five-year deal, that takes him to his mid-30s. That's the big money contract in his career. Yeah. And, like, a five-year at six million deal, like, that's 30 million bucks. I think that's appropriate for yeah. his level of play. You're getting basically a Selkie candidate for, uh, like, you're, his abilities aren't going to just magically vanish at the age of 28. So, you know, he should be fine throughout it. It's not going to be an anchor contract. And you just try to work the dollar, make the dollars work for everybody else around that. And we'll have a lot of money coming off the books this year and next year. And it's just a matter of you know, how the Flames decide to reinvest that money. Yeah, because, like, down the road, like, you can shed guys like, say, Froelich or Brower or, you know, even Giordano at the end of his contract or re-sign him for less. You know what I mean? Like, and you can just figure out different ways of making the dollars work. You got to keep those key parts together, though. Yeah, for sure. Well, Matt, let me ask you sort of a far-fetched question, but uh, every year the NHL awards the Jack Adams Award to the coach who, and this is the actual language on the award, is judged to have contributed the most to his team's success. And when I look around at the playoff teams here, I don't think that there's any other team really where I can say, you know what, the coach has really been part of I'm success. I'm going to argue with you there. but You think yeah. so? Who, who do you think? I'm going to go with his – former partner in Vancouver and I'm going to go with uh, Tortorella in Columbus. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I mean, as it... Yeah, maybe. 
as it sits mm-hmm. right now, though, looking at that Columbus roster, I think they would have been a playoff team anyways. Yeah, I think, honestly, I, I would not be shocked if the three finalists for the trophy were Vancouver's former coaches with Tortorella, uh, Mike Sullivan, and Glenn Gullitson. See, I don't know if you can put Mike Sullivan in there. I think that if you're going to go that way, you have to put Edmonton's coach in. Not really. That uh, you know No, so? it's all McDavid. Like, the rest of the team is crap still. Like, according to, the, like, all the advanced statistics, like, it's basically the Connor McDavid and Cam Talbot show. That's the only reason why they're in a playoff spot. Like, the rest of their team is... Yeah, good point. Like, good if point. you take those two parts out, honestly, I don't see Edmonton being far ahead of Colorado. <laughs> so. No, that's that's a good point. You're right. The whole team isn't together, and we were talking about that earlier. It's, you know, they're starting to get it together, but, yeah, there's still a lot of work that has to be done there um, before we could really say that, yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a coaching thing. McClellan's turning around, but, yeah, it's not there yet. But, yeah, I mean, looking at, you know, the coach's contribution to the team, I think Gullitson has to be in that conversation if the Flames make the playoffs. Oh, yeah. Like, I could see him being one of the nominees. I just don't see him winning it. No, I mean, Bob Hartley was a nominee in 2014, 2015. We didn't expect him to win it then either. So it does show that sometimes there is that, you know, outside chance of winning. But, um, yeah, it would be, I don't know, it would be very difficult for him to win, but I think he has to be a finalist at least. If you can take a ragtag group that's rebuilding and go through a, you know, a playoff spot. Yeah. Um, and I think his chances get better the further we go. Well, aren't they all of the awards voted on, like, before the first round of the playoffs? Are yeah. they? I'm not sure. Yeah. I don't know when that's voted on. So, yeah, that would make sense then. Interesting, though, how Vancouver's, you're mentioning, and I think you're right when I think about it logically. Yeah, it's weird. Sullivan, Gullitson, Torts. It's interesting how all those guys came out of Vancouver working together there. Yeah. Well, you see, uh, Vancouver is a coaching graveyard because, like, even Vigneault, he goes to the Rangers and then they go to the finals. (laughs) So, you know, Willie Desjardins, once he gets fired, you know, expect him to go to a contending team after that or make the team a contender. And so you almost want to you almost want to hire a coach, get Vancouver to hire him for a year with the agreement that then he'll come work for you. Yeah, and it's just like Edmonton; they get rid of players. Dubnik turns into one of the top goalies in the NHL. Schultz is one of the top offensive defensemen in the league. Uh, Sam Gagne has returned to form. Like I'm just waiting for Nail Yakupov to turn it around in St. Louis. Well, yeah, I think. That's partly the environment, too. If St. Louis was doing better this year, I thought he'd be a big part of that. Yeah. So, yeah, no, it's it's not something I've heard mentioned yet, but I'll be the first one to throw it out there. I think that Gullitson has to be in that conversation for what he's done for this team. I don't necessarily think that, you know, like Hartley, that means that we're going to have many successful playoff years under this coach. I think he's definitely going the right direction, but I think that he definitely has to be in that conversation. I just hope that he doesn't crap out the next year like Hartley did. Well, that wasn't all on Hartley, though. No, but, I mean, he's the one that took the blame for it, and we can't afford to just lose another coach. We have a bit of a revolving door as it is. Another piece of interesting Flames news I wanted to bring up that a lot of people might not know is Tim Harrison, a sixth-round selection from the Flames in the 2013 entry draft, has signed an amateur tryout contract with our ECHL affiliate, the Adirondack Thunder according to the ECHL transactions website. So that's kind of kind of an interesting signing. Harrison completed his college career last weekend as the Colgate Raiders lost the opening round of the ECAC conference finals to Princeton. Um, and now he's 24. I mean, this is a, an older player, but that's what happens with college guys. And I think, you know, he's 6'3", he's 200 pounds, but this is a good way for Harrison to try and show the Flames that he should get an AHL deal next year. Yeah, it's basically like getting another Garnett Hathaway mold player and see how he does things. Like, it, he may end up being another in that line of annoying, pesky, defensive-minded players, or he'll just be an a farm player generally and you know we'll see it doesn't hurt to see you know he's a six foot three forward that hits that that's useful so 
The Flames retain his rights until August 15th, which means that he'll be able to come to the rookie camp if they want him to. He'll be able to, you know, be seen on that stage one last time. And there's always, you know, if you look at the Flames, they always sign one or two walk-on guys or one or two, you know, who who is this guy type players. And I think we know that they like that big player. And I think that they might be more willing to bring in a guy like Tim Harrison because, A, he's part of the organization. He's 24. He's a veteran guy. But I think he also – I think that if we if we look at a guy like, um, you know, Hathaway, potentially graduating the NHL next year, it gives us that new guy in the pipeline. That young right winger. Yeah, who, he just got to keep rolling over the, roll the roster. A. Yeah. And at 24, you sign him to a one- or two-year deal. If he doesn't amount to anything, keep him in the ECHL. But, you know, it's not like we're right up against the 50 contract limit or anything. Um, but it'll be interesting because I think, is Kanzig down the ECHL yeah. too? So with him and Kanzig down there, that's two big boys in that team. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens there. I'll, I'll want to follow their stats. So, yeah, just an interesting note there. Um, if for any fans that want to see him, see if you can catch a Thunder game online potentially and see how Harrison's looking. Um, and he has, he's actually put up some good numbers uh, with Colgate this year. He had 26 goals and 53 points in 144 games this season. And, you know, people who think that the NHL plays a lot of games, 144-game season, that's a long hockey season. That's crazy. Oh. So, anyway, just wanted to point that out to fans who are interested. Um we also want to give out a shout out to some of the European Flames fans. We have a number of fans who who listen to our show who are from Europe, various different European countries. Some of whom reached out to us and said they became fans when different European players played here, Kippersoff, other players. And a lot of them have been waking up at four in the morning just to watch Flames games. Matt, can you believe that? That's like, you know, when we have the Olympics in these foreign countries and we're all up at four in the morning to watch Team Canada. Yeah, well, four a.m. is not a bad time, so it's all good. It depends if you got to work that day or not. You're a bit of a night owl, but for me, I'd rather be asleep at 4 in the morning. Sure. But, you know, I think that shows the dedication to this team and the, the dedication the team has commanded from fans. If this was November, I'd probably, if I was one of those guys, go, you know what, I'll PVR it and watch it later. It's not worth getting up that early for. But especially with this 10-game win streak, it's compelling to want to watch that game right away. Yeah. Well, the the Flames have been full marks lately, so at least they're giving the fans something to watch. So for all our fans overseas, uh, thanks for supporting our show. Thanks for supporting the Flames, and thanks for getting up early to watch and be part of the Sea of Red, our global sea that's growing. Should we do the weekly predictions, Matt? Well, I think I know what your prediction is going to be. <laughs> well, let's look at last week first. Last week we had six points in the table. Um, I got all six points in the week of February 27th. I was bold again and predicted six points last week that we'd beat Montreal, Winnipeg, and Pittsburgh. We did. You thought we would not beat um, Montreal. but Or no, you thought we wouldn't beat Winnipeg. Pittsburgh. You picked Montreal, Pittsburgh. I picked Montreal and Winnipeg. No. Oh, there you go. Okay, you're right. I have, yeah. So you got four, I got six. I got the games and the teams right for the last two weeks. So I'm now putting you nine to one as far as our results yeah, go. Yeah, so I now, in order to tie you, I have to get all the predictions exactly correct the rest of the season. So, yeah, there's a chance, but uh, yeah. This is almost like in the mid 90s, you know, when Flames fans are like, you know what, if we can win every game from here on in, we can maybe make the playoffs. Yeah. And then you're eliminated. <laughs> That's right. So, see, so you're the young guns of our predictions game. Oh, goody. <laughs> well, this week we have uh, three more games in the docket. We have the Boston Bruins, the Dallas Stars, and the LA Kings. Boston is on the 15th here at the Dome. Dallas is Friday the 17th, the 7 p.m. start time at the Dome. And the LA Kings are a Sunday night game, 7.30 start time on that one. All three of these games are at home. And let me tell you guys, if you want to go to a Flames game, this is the time to be there. You could be in Flames history by attending any one of these games if this win streak continues. So make sure you go to our friends at Tick Ticks, either on your mobile phone on Android or iOS, get some tickets, and let's pack the dome. Let's make sure that we've got, you know, everybody in there, everybody making noise. All I want to see is red when we watch these games because we've got a road streak coming up after that. So let's pack the house. Uh, Matt, do you want to go first? Yeah, I'm going to go with a repeat 
The Flames need four points out of the six, so I'll go with Dallas and L.A. as the wins. I think the streak ends here. I'll be Debbie Downer. You think that Boston's going to end the streak? Yep. Well, you know what? I got nothing to lose, so I'm going to go with what I've done the last couple of weeks. I'm going to go six points. I think we'll win all three of them, and I, I honestly think the streak ends in Washington. All right. So, well, I might change my mind next week, but for right now, I got nothing to lose. I'm going to go with all six. Can you imagine if we go into that road trip with a 13-game win streak? That'd be ridiculous. What's that? Didn't Columbus have the season high? It was like 12 games? I think it was 14 or 15, actually. I, re I remember that wow. both the Minnesota and uh, Columbus were right up there. Yeah, so we might be among that elite company. And I think, really, if you can win, if we can get this to 13 games, I think you've probably cinched up the some playoff spot. Yeah, oh, for sure. You know, there's you're going to have to have a catastrophe to fall out of it at that point. So, and, and really, of these games, I mean, none of these are hugely imperative that we don't give up a point. You never want to, but if we have a Pittsburgh-like result, Boston's Eastern doesn't matter, Dallas not in the race, and L.A. is not going to bother us if they get another point. Yeah, and by the way, the longest overall winning streak in NHL history is 17 games. Wow. Which was the Pittsburgh Penguins in 92-93. So that would mean that we'd have to win all the three games this week and all four next week. <laughs> we'd have to win in Washington, in Nashville, in St. Louis, and in Colorado. Yeah. Or no, here against Colorado in the Dome. Yeah, and that's just to tie the record, and then we'd have to beat L.A. on the 29th as well. So we're halfway there pretty much, <laughs> just over. You and, you know, if, if we're going to beat L.A. on the 29th, we might as well beat San Jose on the 31st. We might as well beat the Ducks on the 2nd, and then we'll roll into Anaheim and it'll all end. Yeah, of course. Well, uh, if the Flames are on that kind of a winning streak, you'd expect it to end against Anaheim in the Honda Center. I think that no matter how many wins we get, the 4th of April, it all it all comes crashing down. Yeah. That's when you call up your, your prospects, you you know you burn all your emergency call-ups, and you say, you know what, have fun. Well, the last time the Flames won, a Gimla and Kipper weren't in the lineup, so... There you go. Might work. And Craig Conroy well, had and, four assists that game, so... And I guarantee you the next time we win, a Gimla and Kipper won't be in the lineup. True. So, yeah, I don't know. It, it'll be interesting to see what happens. But that's the date I have circled on my calendar is I have it written here as doomsday. Yeah. By the way, Columbus's streak earlier this season was 16 games, so they were one off wow. the record. Okay. So I don't think we'll make that. But, Matt, enjoy the games this week and uh, enjoy whatever we get from the Flames. I think even if the win streak does come crashing down, it's going to be good hockey. Yeah. I think with the way they're playing now, you're not going to see us get blown out. You're not going to see, you know, a really terrible game. I think, I hope that if it's a game like the Pittsburgh game in Boston, that, you know, if you go down fighting in a game like that, that's, a, that's an honorable way to end a streak. Yep. And hopefully they can just keep rolling after that and not ha go on like a four or five game losing streak and lose some of the ground they've made up. Well, that'll be the real test is what happens after the streak ends. But let's not talk about the streak ending. And next week we will be back to talk about a 13-game win streak. And in order to play us out tonight, Matt, what do you have to say to some Brass Bonanza? Works for me. Sounds suitable, doesn't yep. it? Thanks for listening, everybody. Right. Have a good week. This has been another Fireside Chat. Don't forget to subscribe to the show at firesidechat.ca. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash firesidechat. And to follow us on Twitter at Fireside Podcast. Catch our show on the podcast channel at thehockeywriters.com. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike License. Hosted by Dan Stevenson and Matt Dubor. Produced and edited by Peter Marino and Ryan Coetz.